We're back with Bree, and Bree's gonna go through a little bit uh, about the uh, distance measuring equipment. And uh, what did you say about the quality of the equipment? Well, we didn't really have a lot of electronics and avionics on these airplanes back in the back in the day. And so, uh, as I was saying, that this particular aircraft would have had an electronic. Uh, readout for the DME, which stands for distance measuring equipment, which would tell you how many miles you are from the source, the transmitter, right. which would be typically co-located at an airport or at a at a, a navigational fix. And uh, some of them, like this one, would have actually had a ground speed readout, but a lot of the, especially the airplanes that came from um, U.S. Air, which mm -hmm. were the old Piedmont machines, only had a drum type DME. So we had to use the, uh, the timing method where you would time how many miles you traveled in 36 seconds. Mm -hmm. And that would tell you what your speed was in knots. And we always tried to use a, a, a two to one parabola descent. Right. So if you were, for instance, if you were at 30,000 feet, you would want to start down for the runway at 60 miles back. And then you would adjust uh, accordingly, you know, if you had a tailwind or a headwind, uh, you would add or subtract a little bit. And um, which worked good as long as that equipment was based at an airport. But then there were some airports like Regina, for instance, where mm -hmm. the VOR is like miles and miles away from the airport. So, so how would you figure out your, uh, your uh, ground speed from that then? Well, uh, as, uh, essentially what we would do is we would... Uh, turn the weather radar on mm -hmm. and we would use the ground mapping mode and you know the discs would come up 20 40 60 miles back and right. th that's how we could judge that you know okay we're 60 miles back from the airport or the city and, and uh now it's time to start down right wow so that was uh that was pretty much how you figured out uh, your descents then yeah yeah i used to I used to joke that there was high tech, low tech, and no tech. <laughs> and uh, you know what was that, what was the what was the ratio for the Fokker fleet then? Um, more no tech than anything else. <laughs> it also had notoriously bad ADFs. Uh -huh. ADF stands for Automatic Direction Finder, right? Which, um, if you tune in an AM radio station, that you can home into it with the needles, but the as, as good as an airplane as the F-28 was, their ADFs were terrible. <laughs> and there was times that, and, and a lot of the non-directional beacons, which are all obsolete, I, there's hardly any left in Canada, I don't right. think. But they were pretty low power too, so they didn't really have a lot of range. And I remember going out of Vancouver up to uh, Terrace, for instance, where you might be just flying for like a half hour doing nothing but holding a heading because you had nothing uh, you weren't close enough to pick up a beacon yet right. and you were too far away from something behind you and um, so yeah. it's almost like flying blind then well a little bit you you've tried to make use of of um, you know maybe there's a, a VOR station over there right. or you can get a cross bearing or, or um, but it was definitely definitely more hands-on work than than um, you know airplanes now that have GPS sure which sure. were so accurate and everything else. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, one, I, I uh, as I was saying, the, the one thing that I do remember is the, uh, you never touched anything on here unless right. a light came on. Okay. If a light came on, and a lot of the, like the overhead here was mm -hmm. all designed so, um, you know, like here's all the bleed air supply. So if you had like a, a duct that was leaking or something like that. Yes. You might look up and this light might be on. Well, by the time you looked up and saw that, the airplane had already latched the system off and it's just telling you, this is what I did. Right. Um, it, it, it was just uh, so automatic. And I know, I know several pilots that went from flying this to when WestJet first started up, went to fly in their old 737-200s and they said they just could not believe how primitive the Boeings were compared, really? to, compared wow. to the F-28. Yeah. That's amazing. For an airplane that was built in the 1960s, this thing was so ahead of its time. It was a great aircraft. Yeah, it had, uh, the pressurization system was really good on this. Mm -hmm. um, the, 
I think, I seem to recall that we had issues with the, the heating and stuff. And one thing that's interesting with the, with the F-28 is it was designed from the factory to give the flight attendants control of the cabin temperature, which huh. would make sense. You're right. But it didn't work properly. And so this is one of the only instances I can remember of any airplane that I ever flew where the standard position for the switch was to be in the non-standard position. <laughs> because that basically gave us control of the of the so back before the in the days before the the cockpit door was locked and yeah. stuff especially if you were working with some of the experienced flight attendants if they were hot or cold they would just come up and they knew that you know we can crank it up we can crank it down and then they would go back to the cabin <laughs> Oh man, so many, <laughs> so many stories, right? <laughs>